Horses don't belong at the gas station, but there's one here anyways. Its rider is wearing a leather jacket studded with old military medals, what looks like a torso-sized cogwheel slung over her back like a shield, a broadsword underneath the cog shield, and a pair of hollow screen shades. She dismounts. She slides her card through the machine. The pumps start pumping. The horse sticks out its neck, dips its snout, and begins drinking gasoline directly from the nozzle. The rider holds the spout up to the horse's mouth at a bit of an awkward angle. She meets your eyes and shrugs. You know how it is. You don't know how it is. Later, you will see her on the news, clothes lighting a police officer on horseback at 70 miles per hour. You will understand even less, and also, so much more. I've covered a decent number of designers since I started this channel a year and a half ago, but none have so thoroughly impressed me like Emily Xu. Their grasp of prose immediately grabbed me when I checked out Houses of the Sun by Night last year, and I vowed to keep an eye on their work. In the year since, they've unveiled a preview of their most ambitious game to date, one that, even in its beta form, possesses a level of narrative competence and sheer, unrestrained excess that obliterates anything in mainstream tabletops. 10,000 Days for the Sword is a cyberpunk wuxia fantasy about tense fights, factional takeovers, and an absolute deluge of imaginative ways you can whoop ass. If you watch my channel, you know I don't prioritize art or layout or polish. She is certainly not worried about this either, and I think it's 100% to their benefit. Just look at the cover! Are you kidding me? No one else in RPGs is brave enough to put a stock picture of a battle droid getting kicked out of a skyscraper window on the front of their game. When it comes to the games I like, I want games that are weird and unashamed, that wear their influences and goals on their sleeves. Games that, above all else, want their words to be impactful. So let me be the first to tell you. Sword hits like a fucking truck. Shu tells players what the game is about from the first chapter, using the voices of your sect siblings who chime in via footnotes adding context and color. This is a game about violence, but not like that. You're going to be fighting people, sure, but there will be ideologies behind your blows, conversations in the form of duels. The medium is not the message, and the megacity of Shatian needs someone who understands its crooked, rusting heart if any scrap of justice is to be found in its dark streets. And also, Sword is a game about violence exactly like that. There are some tyrants who cannot hear pleas for mercy, who will only listen to the sound of their own crunching bones. The game primarily revolves around combat exchanges, and the myriad ways you can make those exchanges sick as hell. Author Jeanette Ng describes the wuxia genre as one of powerful warriors seeking freedom, martial glory, and revenge, all adjacent to Chinese imperial history. Probably the most famous work of wuxia is The Romance of the Three Kingdoms, an epic novelization of the wars that ended the Han Dynasty in the 2nd and 3rd centuries. But its themes and stories are not dissimilar from European knights dueling from horseback, or American cowboys defending desert towns. Sword is very explicitly a text in the wuxia lineage. The player is told from character creation that they are building a yuxia, a martial artist who cultivates righteousness in herself and fights for it in the world around her. In that vein, players will join up with one of the eight great sects, each of which holds differing philosophies, aesthetics, and most importantly, martial arts styles, which will inform the kind of yuxia your character becomes. From the interesting descriptions of the great sects to the gritty portrayals of Shatian's districts, there's a lot to dig into in the world building of 10,000 Days for the Sword. Even this early version, you can see the potential that comes from seven squabbling factions, each with different worldviews of what a post-imperial city should look like, and how these factions might use their superhuman abilities to beat that city into existence. Shu manages to build a cyberpunk megalopolis in a familiar but fresh light, distinct from traditional rain-drenched and neon-blasted skylines. People still struggle against megacorps and mercenary bands, but these familiar tropes are interspersed with evocative touchstones. A desalination plant where wage slaves slowly choke on salty air, or a construction-themed biker gang that turns their choppers into wrecking balls. The stage is more than set for showdowns of legendary proportion, an excellent backdrop for players' martial dramas. Sword wants you to spend time fighting. In bouts for honor, practice spars with sect siblings, matches to the blood with rivals, and all-out death duels with those you cannot suffer to live. While the stakes of these battles will change, their base mechanic is the same. 
Sword is built around exchanges, a series of high-intensity moments, spats of fist and fury, in which Yusha try to break each other's stance. If you've played games like Sekiro with a block meter, it's sort of like that. You need to push your enemy to the edge before they do the same to you. I'll make things simple. Players take turns rolling pools of d6, determined by their stats. The highest number of the pool is then pitted against their opponent's stance, which will usually be a number between 5 and 7. If your die pool is equal to or greater than your opponent's stance, you gain one momentum, plus an additional momentum for any extra sixes. After your attack is done, your current stance becomes the highest die you rolled. Once you've built up a decent amount of momentum, you can attempt a finisher, a powerful, exchange-ending attack that aims to score a decisive hit on your opponent. If your finisher is equal to or greater than your opponent's stance, you inflict a wound. Wounds are the game's measure of tracking injury, but to contextualize their severity, a brand new character can only sustain two wounds before total defeat. Make sense? You roll a die pool, trying to meet your opponent's stance, building up points until you can attempt a finisher, a decisive blow that will significantly wound them. When stripped down like this, swords' exchanges seem pretty basic. However, once you factor in stat values, interrupts, edge scores, and most importantly, each fighter's martial arts technique, this simple exchange mechanic becomes an interesting and complex tug of war. So I'm a big Naruto fan. I love all that dork shit, that fire style, fireball jutsu shit. You know what I'm talking about? Animal styles named after the creature they represent are a historical aspect of Chinese martial arts, and taking that concept and making it fantasy is extremely fun. And the extremely fun thing Sword does with its combat system is provide characters with dozens of moving parts, mechanical Legos to click together to create their own fighting styles that both reflect their factional allegiances, as well as impact the kinds of ways they do battle. Let's use the Mountain Yields to the Moon's Depth sample technique as an example. You can see there's four distinct parts to this technique. Yield, Moon, Mountain, and Deep each of which add a twist to Sword's combat loop. Each of these portions comes from a different martial arts form, based on the five elements and the concepts of yin and yang. Moon, for instance, is a yin form, based in defense and counterattack. Mountain is an earth form, holding one's position against all adversity. You can make the inference, then, that it is a highly defensive fighting style. However, Characters can also add in additional moves that are not based in the elements or yin and yang, moves that are specific to an individual faction. The gasoline fist fighting style is all about explosive speed and firing movement, amplifying the momentum of a mount and driving it through your enemy's sternum. Remember the passage at the beginning of the review about clotheslining a police officer on horseback at 70 miles an hour? That's gasoline fist. That's what Sword is giving players the tools to do. And I think that's such a cool way to build out a combat system. There are generic techniques that all players have access to, but depending on the sect you follow, you'll gain abilities wholly unique to your character, meaning that as you progress through the ranks, you can develop complex and fascinating builds. Perhaps you open with a more defensive technique, probing your enemy's style and weaknesses, but when things really kick into high gear, you can break out your forbidden abilities and unleash some real damage. You find a build that maximizes momentum, letting you unleash a finisher twice as fast as your opponent, it'll feel incredibly satisfying to crush through their defenses and leave them a senseless heap on the pavement. 10,000 Days for the Sword is still an incomplete version of the text, and there's a good deal of the book that has yet to be written. But as someone who has been ecstatic about Shu's work for a while, I was always going to be evangelical about this game. It's got a flavorful blend of wuxia and cyberpunk, it's got literally millions of combinations of fighting styles in a digestible but crunchy combat framework. To this day, I have yet to read a game with more compelling prose. The writer, who according to the news has a bounty of 3 million wen on her head, pulls the nozzle from her horse's mouth, though the horse noses after it. You kill your headlights. In the gas station floodlamp glare, you watch her tilt the head back and dispense some gas right into her own mouth, like she's drinking from a soda fountain. Her throat bobs. She takes a final mouthful, swishes it around, and swallows, before getting back on the horse and riding away. You just don't get shit like this in mainstream RPG publishing. 
I've been saying for a while that Shi is an underrated designer, and I hope by now I've screamed enough that people have started to take notice. Both lifetime designers and newbies hoping to understand the full capacity of what RPGs can do would benefit from reading nearly any one of their books. But I think Sword is their next evolution, a fleshed out original wildfire of a game. If you'd like to check out the playable preview, and you absolutely should, the link is in the description. The password is Sword. I don't have a conclusion. I want people to read this game and give Emily money for it. I promise it's like nothing you've ever seen. It'll take a few read-throughs to fully grasp it, but once you do, you'll be amazed at what this weird, seemingly amateur PDF is capable of. You don't have time to waste, go get it now. It takes 100 days to master the saber, and 1000 days to master the spear, but it takes 10,000 days for the sword. Hurry up. Hey, thank you everybody for watching. I really appreciate anyone who takes the time to see what I'm saying about tabletop games. And truly, if my enthusiasm did not come through, I cannot stress enough. Emily, she's my favorite designer. Uh, I requested that they get considered for a Diana Jones. I think so highly of them. So please, please, please check out Emily's games uh, on their HO, which is in description. Uh, if you want to find more of my work, I'm at AA Void on Blue Sky, Monster Factory fanfic on Tumblr, but my main site is aavoid.com, where I talk about games, writing, and health policy. I also do two podcasts. The first is Mortified the Friendship Quest, where me and my friend Layla do critical media analysis. Uh, and I do another show, The Bible Boys, where me and my ex evangelical friends, Michael and Josh, uh, talk about Christian media. So if any of those seem like something you might be interested in, uh, please go and check them out. Uh, thank you again for watching. I hope to have another video out uh, soon. Um, uh, until then, see ya!